Hi, I'm Aphrodite Jones. And I was just interviewed by Keith Andrew. I was compelled and excited to talk to somebody who is just an absolute go-getter. Thank you, Keith. to the Keith Andrew Network. That's right, the Keith Andrew Network. I'm here with Ms. Jones in this episode 653. I just want to say it's a real honor and privilege to have you as a guest. Thank you, Keith, for having me. I appreciate it. No, the honor is all mine. For people who want to know what my talk show is about, the whole point of my talk show is to show people that even with having a learning disability, I can still amount to something. And at the same time, I'm able to turn myself into an example for people out there dealing with any types of learning disabilities and disabilities to never give up and prove people wrong. Prove to them that labels do not dictate who you are and who you're going to be. It's prove to them it's them out to something. So hashtag break the labels. So that being said, half hour every time, PT, PT13, but it is uncensored, so I'm it's freedom of speech, whatever you like to say. And for our viewers out there, make sure to go to YouTube.com. When you go to YouTube, go to the KeithAngieNetwork.com. Hit that bell icon and you will be notified when brand new episodes and brand new contacts are available. So make sure to like and subscribe today. Also go to KeithAngieNetwork.com. Now for people who want to know who are... Uh, <laughs> Don't mind me, when I don't do my interviews as a way, my disability shows more. Hint of why I'm right. the show. Now, for people who want to know a little bit about our beautiful guests we have, you are Miss Jones. You are one of the best selling book offers, TV producers. You were had you, you produced one of the hit shows, True Crimes, and you were also on Fox News. Now I'm gonna ask you some easy questions, but each of these categories, I, I've been thinking, you know, my soul is about disabilities and how can that cater to disabilities and, you know, people want to know how to go to point A to point B. So I'm going to ask you pinpoint questions from how did you start, how did you get there, and what are your words of wisdom so that people can follow you? But the first thing got it. I found very interesting is you are one of the best selling book offers out there. And what can you tell us about that? Well, uh, Keith, uh, you know, writing is a very good example of my own disabilities and how I overcame them because, for one thing, I was never accepted as a journalist, ever. Anybody, anything I wrote, nobody wanted me. Um, and I have dyslexia to this day. Um, that said, I, I struggled with uh, doing my graduate work. At the same time, I was very good at the writing part of it, but I wasn't good at the other elements. And so I realized I have to focus on my, my positive point. You know, and, and I think that's important. You pinpoint something that you are good at. And then stay in that lane. So I did that um, because, of course, I wanted to be an actress. And I studied with the biggest acting coach uh, ever who taught Al Pacino and Robert De Niro and Marilyn Monroe. His name was Lee Strasser. He's long gone now. Um, and I really thought I'd be an actress. And, and I found out that no one wanted me as an actress either. So now I couldn't be a journalist. Now I couldn't be an actress. So I thought, I'm going to just go ahead and write my own book. And let's see how that goes. And I wound up uh, in a murder case that, um, again, I was not a murder writer. I wasn't, I was a teacher at the time. I didn't, I was living far away in Appalachia because that's the only place I could get a job. Again, another hurdle that I had to, another lump I had to swallow. I'm not living in New York anymore. I'm living in a place where people have, you know, nothing, really nothing. Poor, poor, poor. Um, and... 
it, you know, uh, a woman was killed there by an FBI agent, and she was deemed to be somebody that didn't count because she was a hillbilly, and I got all up in arms about it because by then I had been living there for two years, and I thought, well, no, no, this can't be ignored by the news. And it was being ignored. And I thought, well, where's CNN? Where is anybody here? And that was 1989. Um, I wound up writing that book. It was my first book. It was called The FBI Killer. It became a TV movie with Patricia Arquette playing the lead of the girl who was killed. Stephen Weber played the FBI agent who killed her. He was the first and only FBI agent, Keith, to ever get sentenced for murder. He copped a manslaughter plea, but that's it, in the whole history of the FBI. So I wrote that book thinking, um, okay, that's great, and there was a TV movie, that's all wonderful success. However, I don't really want to do that. That wasn't my choice. I didn't want to uh, be in the crime world. It's very depressing. And I have a depressive personality anyway. <laughs> So, you know, not another disability, and many of us, many people suffer with, but I happen to be more so, perhaps, than others, and a lot of reasons, but I lost my parents when I was young. That's one big reason. Um, when you feel like you're, you're alone against the world, it's, it's debilitating, believe me. And um, anyway, so now nobody wanted any other book for me besides true crime book, and I thought, well, what am I going to do? And how am I going to get out of this Appalachia place where I don't belong? I mean, they didn't want me there as a New Yorker. I didn't want to be there because where am I? I'm in between West Virginia and Kentucky on the edge of the world, really. Um, and the only way I figured I could get my way out of there was I found another crime story that this time was about four teenage girls who killed a 12-year-old girl in Indiana. And it was on the border of Kentucky right outside Louisville. And I wrote to one of the girls in prison, and she wrote back because I felt like those 16-year-old girls had a story to tell. I don't know what it was, but I need to find out. Why would they do such a thing? And this is before Columbine and all the schoolhouse shootings. This is when I thought, oh, I could make a difference here, right? I'm going to show everybody what's wrong with teenagers and I'm going to help everybody understand their kids. You know, I didn't have kids. I don't have kids. And uh, that didn't work out so well for me that way. But what did work out is that I wrote that book and it hit the New York Times list at number four and stayed there for many months. And that changed my life because now I was a New York Times bestselling author. Um, people still talking about that book. In fact, I just got a request somebody wants to make a movie out of it. I hear that now and then. It's such a harsh story, frankly. You can't make a movie out of it. It's just what they did to that 12-year-old is unspeakable, truly. Um, that's probably the book, of all my books, that people seem to come back to the most. That, and I wrote a book about Michael Jackson. I covered that trial for Fox. So, I mean, the leap, I guess, in talking step-by-step, step, Keith, I know I'm going on here, is that, number one, and the most important thing I can tell anybody with any kind of disability is you got to start somewhere. Okay. It may not be where you thought you were going to start. I didn't think I was going to start in Appalachia. I didn't think I was going to start writing about this hillbilly woman that whose family didn't even want to talk to me. And there was a lot of problems. Nor did I, the police didn't want to talk to me. The FBI was certainly not going to talk to me. And I had a hurdle after hurdle after hurdle. And this isn't what I did as a living. I didn't know. I, didn't, I was in the blind. If I knew now what I didn't know then in 1999, uh, uh, sorry, 1989, 1990, when I wasn't, I wouldn't have done that book. Because nowadays when I write a book, I'm at the trial. This guy didn't have a trial. He was an FBI agent. He took a plea deal. There was no trial. I'm at the, I've got the police reports. These police were not giving me any reports. I've got the, the FBI. You think they were giving me a report? They were giving me nothing. So I was going on out on a limb that I didn't even know I was on. And like I said, you have to start somewhere. And you have to start also understanding that, you know what? I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be in Appalachia. I didn't want to be really focused on just writing. I really still wanted to be an actress in my heart, but now I had to give that up. Um, 
I didn't know that book was going to be successful. I had no idea. And, uh, you know, I think, I think that, you know, along the way, what I was teaching in Appalachia, which is important, is I was teaching writing at a small little college. So in teaching other freshman students how to write, especially in an area where there's not a lot of focus on homework or real learning at that time, I mean, really not. So the people were coming and say, I don't have the homework. I said, well, he said, my dog ate. I said, well, you know, my mother died this or college. Go do it, you know? And um, I, I really learned not only myself how to write, but also how to teach people to write and how to explain that writing is not just automatic. Writing is rewriting. So when I write a book, like right now I'm getting into one, I will write that same chapter over and over, like 20 times, sometimes 30 times in the day. I will just chisel, chisel, work, work, like I'm making a sculpture. And I, I have to, any writer will tell you that that's what you have to do. And man, some people might want to have to do it 30 times, some people might. I feel I need to do that. I also feel though, that at the end of the day, you have to give it your best. It's never going to be perfect. Never. Nothing in life is perfect that we make as human beings. Nobody. So that you give it your best. And once you're at your best job, let it go. You did it. Let it be in the universe. Move on. And I, and I think that's been a guiding principle for me, what I've taught students over the years, because I did teach for seven years as a professor, um, and I was writing at the same time. And I, you know, I taught people a really basic lesson, which is that don't think the first thing you put out there is the best thing in the world or that it's the best you can do, because it's not. And the writer's craft in particular is very uh, symbolic of that. It's, 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 it's generic, I'm sorry, I want to germane to the writing field. In other words, it's, it's tied in completely. Woody Allen said, writing is rewriting. I mean, many of the most famous writers of all time have said this kind of thing. Um, you can't just think, you know, some muse is going to come along. Maybe if you're a songwriter, you can. But when you're really focused on telling a story, and it's a long story, you've got a lot of moving pieces, you can't just blah, 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 think, oh, that's great. No. So that's a step-by-step step in a way. I mean, yes, I took some leaps and bounds in there. But um, those steps I'm back to right now in the book that I'm getting ready to start. On. I'm right back to where I started from, you know, 30 years ago, um, whereby I am forcing myself to do all of those steps. And it means interviews and it means writing notes and it means reviewing the interviews and rewriting the notes and, re and I haven't started real writing yet I'm just doing the preparation for it and it's like I never wrote a book before the way I feel and and I think a lot of people with a learning disability or any kind of sense of powerlessness or you know not enough self sense of centeredness we all feel that at times and you know um you got to push through it. You just you just have to push through it. It's, you know, it's uh, easy to be defeated. It's easy to feel defeated. Um, that's the easy thing to do in life. You know, so many people walk around. Um, a philosopher said, "The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation." And if you think about that. So, in other words, most people are walking around basically silently desperate to be doing something they really want to do, whether they're disabled, not disabled, whatever. They're, we all have a, a disability of some kind. That's the other thing. You know, this idea that there's only learning disabled. It, it, we all have different brains. Everybody has fortes and then not fortes. Um, you know, there are, look at the King's Speech. You know that movie? Yeah. Remember it? And, and here's somebody who was the king of England. 
He was in the midst of a war. He had to deliver, and he couldn't. He couldn't get over his stuttering. Uh, you know, um, I've dated people with that that issue. I, you know, I, I see it and I see the struggle, but yet I can see also they can be very successful. So, uh, you know, I I, I don't I, I don't know that I'm answering your question exactly, but I'm trying. No, no, it's great. Now, but. Older now for people who want to know, or if these are true stories or made-up stories, everything you ever wrote about, period, were all true stories. So right. the question I want to ask you is: Have you ever had to write a story that really bothered you? Oh yeah! Oh my goodness! I'm writing one right now, getting ready. Uh, first of all, the story I wrote in *Cruel Sacrifice*, which I I, met, I referenced. That is one of the most horrifying crimes I've ever been seen, really. And uh, it, it, I mean, it bothers me to this day. There's no way. All of the books I've written, really, though, once you get that deep into a story, you never forget. You never forget the pain and the suffering of the victims and the horror of the uh, deranged person or evil mastermind that's involved. And, um, you know, I've been at some of the biggest and the worst. I, I was there at the Casey Anthony trial. I was there at the OJ Simpson trial. I was there at the BTK killer. I don't know if you know who that is, but it's a ho horrible serial killer that tortured the Wichita, Kansas for 30 years. Um, you know, I've been in these places and watched, Evil, evil people do the most horrifying things and accusations and whatever they can to destroy every life around them for their own purposes. And so, yeah, it, it, it bothers me. And I, I just came from a trial in uh, California, and um, it was a murder trial of somebody who killed his own son, his biological son. And the way he did that was... He had his son go under a truck that he wanted his son to work on. He gave him 50 bucks to work on the truck. His son was 23 years old and had two kids, a three-year-old and, a, and a, I think a, a four-year-old and a two-year-old. And um, he took out an insurance policy on his son. He had the son write a will to him and sign it in a bank on the same day that this accident occurred. And while the son was under the car, he slipped it off of the jack and let the, the car, the, the, the truck, fall on his son. Now, the reason we know he did that is because he actually pled guilty to that in New York. And that, that guilty plea happened in 2013. So, and there was a whole long story as to how that came about. His wife at the time was able to track him, tape him, and work with police. I mean, it's a very involved story. However, interestingly enough, he had his first wife. He lost her in a fire in their house when he lived in California with her. When they first were married and they had three young children, so the well, son... If I sorry, may... So pretty much the guy was mentally disturbed, to long story short. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, please. Beyond mentally disturbed, yes, absolutely. He's, he's, a, he's a psychopath. He's a psychopath. And he got found guilty of killing his first wife as well, just now, a couple of weeks ago, just before this whole COVID thing struck. And um, so I've been pursuing the mind of a psychopath now for eight months talking with him, trying to understand what makes that kind of person exist, you know? How does he exist? You killed your own son. You killed your mother of your children. You let her burn to death in a fire. And the kids watched. It's insanity. So, yeah, that disturbs me. <laughs> well, let me ask you, you know, with, and there is evil in the world. You, you look at Paul Harbert and you look at 9-11. 9-11 is a perfect example, you know, of disturbed, rotten people why that wants to hurt innocent people just for because they get their jollies off. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, 
I actually worked on a piece for um, Inside Edition back in time, where uh, one of the one of the the one of the uh, terrorists who was on Flight 93, the one that went down in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Okay. He was working out and training at a gym very near to where I happened to live in Florida at the time. It was the next town over. And I saw it on the news and I thought, these people were all, you know, learning how to do the pilot training and close quarter training. It was in Florida and that's where I lived at the time. So I, I'm going to go to that gym and find out. And I did. And I did uh, work with the gym owner. And we did a piece for Inside Edition because he was showing this terrorist how to do uh, kung fu, how to literally rip people's throats and eyes out. And, you know, it, it, it just never made sense to me that, um, you know, that kind of evil for what? You know, what did they really accomplish? But, you, you, you know... It's hard to make sense out of evil, and that's that's again another thing I have to constantly struggle with. I'm doing it now, you know, with this killer. It's like I don't know. I feel like I'm beating my head up against a brick wall, but I know I'm getting somewhere. No, absolutely. You know? And he mentioned you about you did a film on the, the first story you did, and you know there, why would someone want to see the film? You know, there's a film or movie about OJ and Michael Jackson. Okay, Michael Jackson didn't really do much. But, you know, like a 9-11, who wants to see stuff like that? Unfortunately, you live through it. No one wants to see it on a big-ass TV and it surrounds that. It's not an action movie. It's not something you want to say, oh, that's the best movie ever. Because right. my parents want to see Flight 9 to 3. And at the very end, when people got up at the end of the movie, you can hear a pin drop. It's like you... Watch it live on TV. You witness it. Why do you want to pay $12 to see it on a big screen? Unless you're mentally disturbed. Then you, hey, you know, more power to you. You can go, oh, like with some of those stupid killing games, you know. If you really have yeah. that severe mental problem, then more of a power to you. But it isn't, and let me go phrase that. It isn't the video games. You know, they say Grand Theft Auto was a big thing, encouraged kids to kill. And there's other things like San Andreas and there's like uh, St. Rose. It isn't the video game. You just have to remind your uh, child it's a game. That's all it is. Once they start lasting out and reenacting it, that's where the issue begins. Totally. And I wrote a book about that kind of thing. It was called The Embrace. And it's out there. And it's about teens who were playing the role-playing game on, I, I can't think of what it's called anymore, Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And, okay. And they wanted to be vampires. And they started to take away from the role-playing and becoming, thinking that they're real vampires. And ultimately, they killed this girl's parents. They, they murdered them in cold blood outside of Orlando. And, uh, you know, you wonder about the, the division between reality and, and games and also why her parents, not to blame the victims, but they never paid attention to the fact that their daughter was, you know, changing her hair color, changing to, to gothic. Going, and I'm not, not to say anyone who's all gothic is going to kill somebody, yeah. but... You might want to pay attention to some signs of what's going on because they had no idea she had these friends from a different state. One guy was a psycho killer. I mean, it, it's an oddball example, surely, but it's there nonetheless. You know, it's cautionary. And it's like, you know, weeks in a way, you know, I won't mention the store I work in, but I work in a supermarket. And with everything going on, I walked past this one guy. Who had it? Okay, we don't sell gun guns, like, uh, you know, um, things that kill you. We sell, uh, well, to legalize, we sell BB guns. Uh, and that's really about it. And this guy had three of them in his wagon. And there's a gun store in my town where I live. And where they, you know, people were supposed to be quarantined before they were quarantined. You had this 
big ass line going all the way around, and he had these schmucks who were buying guns. I'm like, really? Toilet paper and guns. Well, okay, I guess if you run out of toilet paper, I guess you'd be shooting the crap off your butt. Maybe that's why. <laughs> but it's like, I don't get it. Toilet paper and guns? It's, people are, that's the bottom line is people are stupid. They're selfish. They're ignorant. They're crazy. And, you know, there's, there's these people that you can be the honest, hardworking person like you and me. I said in my talk show a while ago, anyone with special needs or has a disability, period, should be banned from getting firearms. And people are like, well, what about your Second Amendment? I do support the Second Amendment. However, if you are a danger to someone, to your family, or people around you, and you have any type of disabilities, then you can just flip a switch like that, play it safe. No gun. It's like the, uh, from um, Seinfeld or the Soup Nazi. No soup for you. So for you, it'd be like, <laughs> no gun for you. You want a gun? Right. Well, get, you're, get a you're paintball gun. You're you're absolutely, you know, I, I happen to agree with you. And I think, I mean, clearly you look at New, Newtown, uh, Connecticut, that person who had access to all those guns was clearly, I, I don't know what his disabilities were, but he, he felt in, inadequate and that his mother was paying attention to elementary school kids rather than him. I mean, what business did he have near any kind of gun uh, ever? And, uh, I, as again, I, I can only say he's definitely mentally ill. I don't know how you you, you characterize that um, into a disability, but I agree that you, you got, we have to start figuring out a way to kind of say, okay, there's there's certain qualifications you, you kind of have to meet in order to uh, have your Second Amendment right um, if you want it, and that's fine if, if you want it. But if you are mentally deranged, yeah. Or you are otherwise, um, you know, have a, a, some kind of disability, you might want to not give those people a gun. <laughs> I mean, you know, it kind of just makes sense. And uh, we haven't figured it out quite yet, you know. And I don't know when we will or how we will because it's a hard one. It's a hard one. And the NRA, the NRA is a bunch of idiots. If they really want to do background checks, this is how you do background checks. Every six months, they say, you want to buy a gun? Well, you're going to do A to Z, all the tests. Okay, six months later, we're going to reevaluate you. Six months later, again, first time you show depression, the first time you kind of last out, that's it. Now, I do support the right to bear arms, and I do support killing only in self-defense. If mm -hmm. someone breaks into your house, if someone's gonna, trying to kill you for wh whatever reason, you have every right to defend yourself, period. End of story. That's all I'm going to say about that. But just saying you have the right to walk around with it, and say you go into the supermarket and you say, oh, I have a permit. It doesn't make it right. People in Texas. Of course. People, of course. People in, people I agree with you a thousand percent. No, absolutely. People in Texas said, you know, if everyone had a gun, uh, there would be less shootings around. Actually, I think it would be the opposite. But the, the, the point is, people, you can't fix stupid, pretty much. Well, it, you know, it, there has, I think there has to come a point where there's more than just a Brady Bill. Yeah. Um, you know, the, there has to come a point where there's more screening involved. I do know in New York, for example, they make it very, very hard to get a pistol in New York. Um, why can't they do that elsewhere? I don't know. But they do here in New York. Um, that said, the other, the other thing I don't like about the guns is that, uh, for example, I've shot guns because of, for my work. I've had to, there are people that are killers that have gone in and become expert target people, and I've had to go there and kind of figure out who they worked with, and I've done it. Um, it's very violent even to shoot the gun because there's a, a kickback on you. Yeah. But also, even though I've done it, I'm not comfortable with it. I don't want to gun around because what can happen is 
the person that's coming after you can grab your gun and now you're you're the victim. So uh, it's it's a you know it's a fine line, Keith. That and um, I I don't know how we're going to resolve that as a country, but I do think that we have to come up with something, something. At least for people who have disabilities and mental disabilities yeah. in particular. No, well, as I was saying, anyone who has any types of learning disabilities and disabilities should be banned. And it's funny because I keep saying this in a couple of, a while ago, you know, I said this back in 2015, 2016, and it came out recently, like a year or so ago. I was thinking it's on Fox News or CNN, uh, where they actually said there's put in restrictions on people with disabilities about buying guns. And it's like, really, it took for someone for me to say it? I'm not saying I'm the one who stirred it up and brought it up. But, you know, it's, you have to, and you can be the most civilized person. You can have a you know, white collar family, and one day you just flip. I don't, the only people who should have guns are law enforcement. Unless you're in a law enforcement you know, God gave you two hands for a reason. You know, you know, be a man and fight, not be a coward. Well, you know, I, I think on that point with you, Keith, you know, I, I want to agree entirely, <laughs> but I, I really do think that people should have the right to bear arms. Back to the Second Amendment. Yes. Um, especially because most of the people who are criminals they easily get guns. So they can come into your house and ask with a gun right in your face. And then what? So, I mean, but that said, it doesn't mean that you can't find a way to curtail it or, or you know, find a way to uh, get guns out of the hands of people that are mentally disturbed or disabled. That's really, I think that should be the number one goal. And if we can do that without, it will not upset the apple cart, right? And I think it'll accomplish a whole lot. So, I mean, I think the best thing out of this whole conversation, Keith, is what you're saying. No, I agree with you. Now, wrapped up for talk show, I do have a couple questions for you off the air. But okay. wrapping up, how can people read about you and follow you on social media? Okay, so I have a website. It's Aphrodite Jones. Doc, uh, I'm sorry, Aphrodite Jones. Uh, dot com. Yes, that's what it is. So it's just my name, A P H R O D I T E J O N E S. Dot com. That's my website. You can see my books there. You can see my TV appearances there. Um, you can go to the ID Network Investigation Discovery and put in True Crime with Aphrodite Jones, and you can see my television show there. I think it's also available on ID Go, which is another outlet to see. I did six seasons of my show with ID. Um, I have uh, my Facebook is Aphrodite Jones. <laughs> my, uh, let's see, everything is basically Aphrodite Jones. <laughs> My Twitter, I, I think my Twitter is True Crime with Aphrodite Jones, actually. That's the that's the real one, you know, the, the verified one, which is the name of my TV show. So, yeah, those are the places to follow me. No, absolutely. And now for our listeners, every time we do an episode, it's always got to be different and unpredictable. That's what makes it fun about the Keith Angie Network, because it isn't scripted, it's just... I like the unpredictability. I like to see where it goes. But my last question for you, wrapping up, when I first approached you to be a guest on my talk show, what was your first honest reaction, and what made you say yes, and how do you feel now? My first honest reaction was I was very happy to get get approached by you. Um, I actually have a friend who runs a whole organization about different brains, and uh, I, I've worked with and been around a lot of people who have all kinds of disabilities from my childhood on. Um, to me, I felt you're a hero. You are a hero in this world of, of the world that the whole world and in particular in the world that you, you are within, you know, the hand, the hand you were dealt, Keith, you're playing it out and that's it's full out and that's everything. So I was, I was grateful. I mean, I'm happy to be, uh, 
and do anything that's going to help somebody else out. And, and I'm also very proud to be with somebody who's taken their life and done everything they can do with it, you know, so far. And you'll do more. I'm sure you will. And, you know, you were the kind of person that's a role model and should be a role model, not only to disabled people, but to everybody. So for me, I wanted to be on here with you. No, absolutely. Now, wrapping up the show, I do have a couple questions for you off the air. But it was a real honor and privilege to have you as a guest, and I'm looking forward to part two down the road. Okay, you got it. Party. Hey, I'm Laura Menino. Hi, I'm Deborah Jensen. I'm Linda Collins. Hi, I'm Marissa Joy Davis. This is Michelle Wong. And I'm Nancy Rose. My name is Brandy Hunt. And Hello, my name is Raven Wynn. Hi there, my name is Giovanna Vidal. Hi, I'm Monica Thomas. Hi, I'm Paisley Blackburn. I'm Ashley Burgess. Hi, my name is Jeanette Abney. Hi, I'm Sharon Spank. Hey, this is Samantha Moore. Hi, I'm Melody Jones. Hi, my name is Becky Yee. Hi, you're watching the Keith Andrew Network.